Good evening, church. It's indeed a pleasure to stand in the presence of the Lord and the congregation that is called and chosen. All of us who are seated here today is not by our own violation or by our own choice that we are present in the sanctuary this evening. It is because the Lord has planted a seed in your heart to worship him, to interact with him, to communicate with him, to pour out your heart to him. So therefore, you are here this evening, and I firmly believe you are here with a purpose. And the purpose is to listen to what the Lord has to say to each one of us. I welcome you once again, and it's my privilege uh, to share the word of God that just came to me when I was contemplating and uh, deciding what I should talk about. After much deliberation in my mind and prayer, I remembered numbers and then said, a snake, which is anti-type of the real, has to be lifted up for people to be saved. Let's pray. Our kind, eternal, gracious Heavenly Father, our hearts are swelling with gratitude for the wonderful way that thou hast led us in the past and for bringing us into thy presence this evening. Even though we are not worthy, even though we are not righteous in our acts and in our deeds, thou hast not forsaken us, but thou hast called us with a purpose. We are the chosen ones that thou hast called us. We are the remnant of the remnant that thou hast called us. So this evening, dear Heavenly Father, as thy remnant children ponder and understand the plan that thou hast laid for them, for their future, and for their salvation. Please be with us tonight. Bless us. May this meeting be a glory to bring honor and glory to thy wonderful name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. When we think about the cross, our minds would go back to the situation where Jesus was inhumanly hung on the cross. I'm sure you would, the scene would come back to your memory. And then you would like to see, those of you who have seen the passion, would, would like to imagine that is exactly that way it happened. I really congratulate this evening the worship committee for selecting this topic, drawing us closer to cross. If you, if you really look at the cross, it is nothing but two pieces of wood, one vertical, one horizontal, hinged together to make a symbol. And this symbol was the symbol of cruelty of the Roman Empire. Any criminal that was against the state was hung on that cross. But to a Christian, that symbol is a symbol of redemption and salvation. That symbol stands out singly in the whole world among, amongst all religions. And that cross speaks to your heart. A union with Christ by living faith and enduring. Every other union must perish except the holy union that the Lord created in the Garden of Eden. This evening when we walked up, I walked between the two distinguished individuals who are husband and wife. That is the union that the Lord represented. And then we will notice that when you build a union with Christ, there should not be any other union except one union that has been ordained in the Garden of Eden. Now we will notice that Christ first chose us. We did not choose him. He was not our choice. If a choice was given to us, I'm sure some of us will choose something else. Like when we were all growing up, we said, what profession you want to choose? Oh, some said doctors, some said engineers, some said, oh, I want to be a pastor, some said I want to be a teacher. 
But no matter what profession you are called, the only calling that the Lord places before you is the cross. And the cross is your symbol. You may not wear it in your neck. You may not, I may wear it on my coat lapel and I say I'm a Christian. But when I try to in, analyze and evaluate myself, then the question looms in my mind, am I really a Christian? Am I really carrying the cross of Christ? Now these are personal questions that you and I have to answer to God, if not today, tomorrow, if not tomorrow, in the near future. So therefore, it says, Christ chose us first. He paid an infinite price. There was no value on the price that he paid. And we'll also notice that this union between Christ and ourselves is going to cost us something. And that something is pride, self-exaltation, self-sufficiency, self-actualization. It's going to cost the very being that is within you, which is selfish. And he says, when you come to the cross, you've got to lay down all this at the foot of the cross. Like in the Christian's pilgrim, the Christian was carrying a, a, a big, huge bag. In that bag was the sins of the world. And then he wanted to go to a paradise city. He was asking everyone on the street, where is that city? And finally, in one uh, downtrodden, distorted, old village they showed him the cross she said that is the paradise so he climbed the hill dropped his bag at the foot of the cross that's what you and i have to do we are all pilgrims we are journeying we are not stationary we are in a movement so therefore we are supposed to be moving towards in the direction of the cross if there is no cross there is no Christian. There is no identity. You can say I'm a Seventh-day Adventist, but you are a Seventh-day Adventist Christian. You need the cross more than anybody else. Because cross leads you to such a situation in life that it says you must humble yourself before God who has created you. It teaches a lesson of humbleness when we look at the cross. When we ponder and survey the wondrous cross, I'm reminded of the concluding words of John Bunyan in the book, Grace Abounding to the Chief of Sinners, page 172. He goes on to state, of all the tears, they are the best that are made by the blood of Christ. I would like to repeat that. Of all the tears this world has shed, of all the tears the members of the remnant church have shed, of all the journeyings that you did, and then you cried. When you cried in the midnight on your pillow, he says, the best tears were the tears of Jesus Christ and his blood. And of the joy that is the sweetest, that is mixed with the mourning over Christ. When you mourn for Christ, his death on the cross of Calvary, because you will realize and understand that he did not simply die in vain. He died because your sins and my sins. He took upon himself and said, I will be a substitute for the punishment that you are supposed to receive. I am your substitute. And therefore, John Bunyan says, with Christ in your arms, kneel before God and pray. There are three elements that he's talking about. One, he says, the tears made by the blood of Christ, the sweetness mourning with Christ, a mourning over Christ. And the third point, he says, when you kneel, kneel with Christ in your arms and pray. I don't know how many of us do that, but that's what John Bunyan said. He said, if you really want to be a follower of Christ. You need to mourn. You need to cry because he sacrificed. If you get hurt, you cry. There is pain. 
The other day, my wife did a flip in the bedroom and she broke her arm. There was tremendous pain, a pain matchless. She couldn't bear the pain until unless she was given a tablet by the doctor so that the pain could be numb. But when you compared that pain with the pain of Jesus hanging on the cross, there is no relationship, there is no relevance, because the pain is beyond human comprehension, beyond human imagination, beyond human experience, beyond anything else that you imagine with. That pain was so enormous that you will notice that when you read Matthew 27, it says, at that particular moment, the father turned his head away and Jesus was alone on the cross, hanging. And he cries, my father, my father, why have you forsaken me? Why have you left me? My job is not yet done. Why did you leave me? He had to leave because he has to be an atoning sacrifice for our sins. So when we further, so further ponder and search the scriptures, we will notice that the people who have encountered the very presence of God, the God himself who came down and protected them from all harm and danger, the Lord that led them through the Red Sea, the Lord that delivered them from slavery, the Lord that made or drowned the Egyptian army in the Red Sea, and the Lord who opened a dry path for them to cross, they forgot. Numbers 21, chapter 4 to 9 says, these people, even though they have witnessed the very power of God, even though they have experienced the light in the night, the, the light by day and the Light by night, they, they, they experienced in such a way that nothing in the wilderness was harmful to them. But one particular moment in, in Numbers chapter 21, verses 4 to 9 states that they started grumbling. They murmured. They grumbled against God. They, they disobeyed God. They disrespected God. And then therefore, they murmured in such a way that the Lord was vexed with their murmuring and with their grumbling. Here, after witnessing the mighty power of God, the children of Israel were at a crossroad, and instead of trusting him, instead of going forth in faith, they turned back and grumbled and asked a very, very challenging question to God and to Moses and said, why, why did you bring us to this land, to this wilderness, so that we could die? Is that your intention? Was that your plan, that we all should perish in the wilderness? Why did you bring us here? There is no water, there is no bread, and the manna that you give us every day has no taste, it's worthless. We are fed up eating the heavenly food. Why? Why did you bring us to this wilderness? The very people who witnessed during that wilderness journey, who had the power to defeat a Canaanite king, and the Lord was with them in that battle, gave them the victory, and when they had to travel, surrounding Edom and going across into the promised land, they could not bear and endure the journey. And therefore, they said, it is their right to question. How many of us have ever questioned God? Have we? Do we have the audacity to question the creator that created us? Is it worthwhile to question, the God, uh, to question the Creator? Is it in our interest that we raise our voice against God? Now we will notice that the experience that the children of Israel experienced was such a unique one. 
Here, they are on a journey towards the promised land. They were right at the borders. And yet, they did not believe God. They were not sure that they would have that promised land, the land that was flowing with milk and honey. Likewise, we are all journeying in a land, in a desert, in a wilderness. There are a lot of fiery serpents around us. You're driving your beautiful Mercedes E320. You meet with an accident. Your Mercedes cannot save you. You're driving with your Lexus. You meet with an accident. Your Lexus cannot save you. I drive an infinity. My infinity cannot save me. But you and I know very well that when we travel, when we walk around, when we go about doing the work that the Lord has given, we have his protection. We have his power hovering us over us and protecting us from all harm and danger. In a situation like that, do we have the heart to question God? But here, the children of Israel who have basically, who have basically experienced the very protection of God, they turned against and questioned him. They did not value his tears. They did not value his cross. So therefore, when they said, please, please save us from this fiery serpents, the Lord could have said, really? You want, to, want me to save you? Why should I do that? Why should I save you? There's no need. Because you grumbled against me. You disobeyed me. You do not even trust me. You have no faith in me. Why do I have to save you? But the Lord did not say that. Graciously, the Lord showed his generosity and then came to their aid and found a solution to the problem. All he said was, make a bronze serpent, put it on a pole, lift it up. And anybody that is bitten by these fiery snakes, all they have to do is look up and be saved. Look up and be saved. The one who had faith, the one who thought now the Lord is his shepherd and he has nothing to lose except to look. And the one who said, oh no, how would I be saved just by looking at the a bronze serpent. They died. But the one who looked was saved. The very question, why did you bring us to Egypt? Why did you bring us to Egypt? I'm sure I have no answer for that. The only reason why the Lord brought them out of Egypt is because of the promise he made to Abraham that your seed, your generation, will occupy this land. He has to keep his promise to Abraham. It is not the children of Israel who were in, the, in Egypt do, under slavery. It is a promise that he made to Isaac. It is a promise that he made to Jacob, that the Lord was on trial at that particular moment to fulfill his promise. So therefore, my friends, as we are journeying, in this evil world, we will be bitten by fiery serpents. We will be tested for our faith. Where do we stand? When I think of lifting up Christ high above the throng, there is no other way but the cross. If you look at the original crucifixion on the, on the hill of Golgotha, you will notice that Golgotha hill was a round hill when there is a cross, the cross could be seen miles away. And it was lifted high above the people. And Jesus very clearly says, when I am lifted up, I will draw all men. Until unless he is lifted up, he is not going to draw anybody. So therefore, 
we will notice that in John 28, Jesus said in his discussion to the leaders, when you have lifted up the son, then shall ye know that I am he and I do the will of my father. John 12, 32 says, and I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men. Let us consider three steps that this cross can magnify and bring a meaning to our lives. The first point says, understanding cross. How many of you understand the cross? May I see your hands? How many of you understand the cross? Do you bear your cross? Do you bear the cross along with Christ's cross? You don't physically bear the cross. But what God is saying is, bear your cross as well as mine. I have a burden. And his cross would be love one another. Cherish one another's association. Praise the Lord that created you. Some of us can't even do that. So he says, the understanding of cross, it, in Romans 5, it says, God commanded his love for us while we were yet, come on church, while we were yet sinners. He did not say while you are yet righteous. He did not say while you are a good person, you are the greatest person. No. He said, while you are a sinner, period. Romans again says, all have sinned and come short the glory of God. There's not even one righteous. All have sinned. St. Augustine suggested, the answer to the mystery of the universe is who? Is God. Answer to the mystery of the universe is God. And the mystery of God is Come on, church. The mystery of God is Christ. The mystery of the universe is God, and the mystery of Christ, uh, God is Christ, and it says, and goes on further to say, the answer to the mystery of Christ is found in his sacrificial spirit. And he goes on to say, that is a supreme evidence of the cross. Supreme evidence. And we also notice that to really understand God, one must have an attitude of mind and heart that responds to the meaning of the cross. Selvin Hughes very clearly says in his book, uh, The Morning Devotional, The Light from Above, he says, to understand art, one must have art within. You must have the spirit and the attitude to understand art. And then it also says, if you want to understand music, you must have music in your heart. And now comes the punchline. He says, one must have music within. And to understand the cross, one must have the sacrific sacrificial spirit with it. In other words, what Selvin Hughes is saying is, until unless you have that, that sacrificial spirit within you, you will not understand cross. Cross is a symbol of love and sacrifice. He says, until unless you have that spirit of sacrifice, you will not understand the cross. And he also goes on to say, those who profess to know Christ, but live only for self, will know something about the cross. Will know something about the cross, but will miss the real meaning of the cross. And further he says, cross is best understood not by argument, but by an attitude. He 
you can best understand cross not by an by an argument but by an attitude in my evaluation in my mind i felt cross is a key to our lives cross is key you must have heard many arguments by different religions the one and the foremost answer they give is all paths of different religions will lead to heaven some may be same some may be different if that is the true statement and if that were to be correct then the sacrifice of christ on the cross is in vain has no meaning it doesn't mean anything to you and me because it lost its meaning and he says we can have any religion to follow but that is absolutely not true the reason is the death of christ is that god himself became a substitute for our sins and died on the cross to redeem us the sinners no god in other religions have come down for a sinner only christ did only jehovah did for god so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son only son and he came down and died for a sinner now we will notice that no uh, no authentic divine self sacrifice comes from other faiths cross stands as a substitute absolutely in unique in its own nature there is no similarity there is no other substitute for the cross cross itself is a substitute for our sins and top lady puts in his him beautifully he says in the cross of christ i glory towering over the wrecks of time all the night of sacred story gathered round its head sublime now top lady says in the cross of christ i glory there is no other point in my life to glory except christ to live in the shadow of the cross is the greatest experience of life the experience that leads us to god's own heart and to the beautiful life eternal here at the cross life finds meaning and purpose to a successful christian living cross is the heart is the way to god's heart cross is a symbol that reminds each of us that christ died for us if we cannot take that meaning to our lives i think the cross loses its value it will be in vain first corinthians chapter 1 18 talks about the uniqueness of cross it says for the message of the cross is foolishness for those who are perishing the message of the cross is foolishness for those who are perishing but to us which are saved is the power of god but for us who are saved who are called by a purpose who are called by his name we have we are a peculiar people chosen from the world and we are seated here tonight being the remnant church because you are the remnant of the remnant and now is your turn the lord says you have power because i saved you and therefore cross becomes a major stumbling block for other religions other religions cannot boast anything like christianity can do christianity can shout on the rooftops and say christ died for me no other religion can do that now we will notice that a japanese christian by name kagawa 
makes this beautiful statement. He says, Christians said that, uh, sorry, Kagawa, the Japanese Christian said that it was in the cross. Please pay attention. It was in the cross that he found Christianity's greatest uniqueness. And he says, before his death in 1960, he said, I'm grateful to Shinto. I'm grateful to Buddhism. I'm grateful to Confucianism. I owe much to these faiths. Yet, these three faiths utterly failed, utterly failed to minister to, my, to the deepest needs of my heart. Utterly failed. They could not satisfy the deepest needs of his heart. He says, I was a pilgrim journeying upon a long road that had no turning. I was weary. I was footsore. I wandered through the dark and dismal world where tragedies were thick. Buddhism teaches great compassion. But since the beginning of time, since the beginning of time, who declared, this is my blood of the covenant which is poured out for many unto remission of sins. That was a Japanese Christian said. He says, ultimate reality is Christianity has a unique symbol and that is the cross. Nothing can satisfy the needs of my heart except cross. We will notice that another growing religion of the world which is growing very fast. It is, it is surpassing any other religion, is Islam. Now, it says, of course, Islam proclaims mercy of God. Each chapter of the Quran is introduced with these words, in the name of Allah, compassionate and merciful. But they do not tell us the whole story, the historic story, the historic display of God's mercy that was portrayed on the cross, spoken in each of the Gospels. In Islam, Allah is merciful to those who are meritorious, who would pray five times a day and fast during Ramadan season. In contrary, Christianity, in Christianity, God is merciful to the sinner, not because of their good words, but because of Christ's sacrifice on the cross. Now we will notice that uh, in the uh, book of Isaiah chapter 53, we will notice that it has been depicted how Christ would be crucified. He was bruised for our sins. He was transgressed. He was beaten. He was spat upon. He was treated like the dust of the earth because he wanted to give us redemption. Have you considered the calling of the cross? How real it is to you in your life today? When cross becomes the central focus of our real in our lives, we will be able to declare to the world the wondrous nature of the cross as did Martin Luther in the year 1517 when he stood before the council and he declared, unless I am convinced by the scriptures and the plan and the plain reason, I do not accept the authority of the popes and the councils for they have contradicted each other. My conscience is captive to the word of God. I cannot and will not recant anything, for to go against conscience is neither right nor safe. Here I stand. I can do no other. God help me. That was a reality that cross drove Martin Luther to say those words on the reckoning day of his life. He said, I cannot recant. I cannot say cross is fake because cross is real. Desire of Ages, page 
758 says, Christ did not yield up his life till he have accomplished the work which he came to do. With, and with his parting breath, he exclaimed, it is finished, the battle is won. Again, Desire of Ages, page 762. By his life and his death, Christ proved that God's justice did not destroy his mercy, but that sin could be forgiven and the law is righteous and can be perfectly obeyed. Satan's charges were refuted. God has given man unmistakable evidence of his love. Where are you today, my friend? My fellow remnant, where are you today? How is your journey going? Have you encountered the cross? Have you weighed the price? Have you come to a conclusion in your life that Christ, that the cross could be a way of life? That it could, that it could provide an avenue to God's own heart? Have you encountered Christ and his cross in all the facets of your life. Where do you stand today? It is your personal question. You would evaluate yourself. No one else need to tell you where you stand. You know better. So this evening, if there is anything else that I could say to you as a friend, as a believer, I would say, Lift him high so that the people who are perishing darkness will be able to see him and be drawn more closer to the kingdom of God so that you and I will obey the calling that he has placed before us. As I said in the beginning, you are not here by your choice because God called you for a purpose. Seek that purpose. Find what he wants you to do. Do it with wholeheartedness. Commit yourself. Dedicate yourself. You, you not only will have to deal with this world, but you will have to deal with the cross itself. Lest I forget Gethsemane. Lest I forget thine agony. Lest I forget thy love for thee. Lead me to Calvary.